Well, good morning, everybody. We'll, uh, I heard the bell ring, and I know everybody's got things going on, so we'll go ahead and begin. Abba, Father, in Christ's name and your Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, for the light shining through the windows. And Lord, we know that the light of Christ shines upon us and within us constantly. Holy Spirit, we ask that you be our rabbi today, that you would continue to teach us from your living word, that you would inspire us to understand and empower us to live Christ each day. And we thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, Monday morning when I woke up, it was really a blank slate. We had been in San Diego last week. Our oldest son, our Navy son, had been at uh, sea for seven months, and um, he was coming in, and we had an opportunity to meet the ship. We'd never done that. When he was in Japan for three years, obviously we couldn't, and uh, that was a, a profound experience, and I was thankful for that, but just with all the rush of Thanksgiving and the travel, um, a lot of attention focused on that. And I woke up Monday morning and it was like, well, okay, wow, it's a new week and what's going on. And, uh, through the course of the morning and I was praying about what Abba wanted to say today, and I really didn't have a clue initially, but he led me to a phrase, uh, a certain place. And, uh, when he did that, I knew that he was wanting me to sit down with him and soak in it and unpack it. And so that's where we are today. We're going to talk about a certain place. And I pray that this is uh, powerful for you. There's probably at least someone in here uh, to whom this will speak. This, of course, is the story of Jacob and uh, his brother Esau. And uh, everything's already gone down. Jacob has the birthright. He has the blessing. Uh, his mother's speaking to him and says, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran. So Jacob left Be'er Sheba and went toward Haran. Well, Be'er Sheba means well of the sevenfold oath or well of the covenant. And Haran means a dry or parched place. And one of the things that we can all understand in this is in our journey of identity and purpose in the Lord, you will, at points, find yourself in a place you cannot stay while you're looking toward a place that seems dry. And in those times, you have to remember his oath, his promises to you. And this is where Jacob is. And of course, you know the story of how he has a twin brother, but he's the second of the two. He was born second, so the birthright uh, went to his brother initially. He prized it, he desired it, uh, and he got it. And then, of course, he also needed his earthly father's blessing. Subsequently, he would need his heavenly father's blessing, and we know he, how he connived to get that. And, and that's not cool. That's not okay that he was a conniver and a schemer. But the thing that set him apart was he desired the birthright, and Esau was very flippant about it. And the birthright is Christ. That's, he's the firstborn of the dead. He's, he's God's eternal son. And so the birthright represents all he is, all he has, and it represents Abba's purposes. And so the one son prized the birthright, and the other didn't. So Abba honored Jacob's desire for that birthright even though there was a lot that Abba still had to work into him. But so he finds himself in a place where Esau now really realizes what he's done. It's not so much that he uh, is grieving over the, the spiritual loss. He's just grieving over the authority and the, the power that that birthright held and that he gave it up and his brother connived to get it. So he wants to kill him. And that's a difficult Thanksgiving, I'm thinking. You know, your, your brother, confront, he consoles himself with the idea of killing you. That's not a good dynamic, and his mom knows that. And so she's saying, you really need to leave. He can't stay in a place where his family was, where he would otherwise want to be. And what he's looking toward is a dry place, not that exciting either. And so we're all at times in our lives, you find yourself in a situation where it just, you can't stay here anymore. This isn't working. This isn't what God has for me. It's not that your brother wants to kill you necessarily, but you just know that you have to move on. But when 
you look toward moving on, that doesn't seem so great either. It seems like a dry place, or you're not real sure about it. We all find ourselves in this situation from time to time. Well, there was a divine intersection, and he came to a certain place, Genesis 28, 11, came to his pagah, and it means to encounter, to meet, to reach, to touch a boundary, to reach the mark, and it also means to make intercession, to pray. And what's interesting about that in the Hebrew, pagah, to reach the mark, uh, in the Greek, the Greek word for sin literally means to miss the mark. And that's what sin is. It's, there's the mark who is Christ. Sin is missing the mark. But Pagai, he came to, he, he made a mark. He touched a boundary. He, he reached a certain place. The word certain place is machom. And it's a standing place, a position. It's a post. It's an office you might hold. It's a city. It's a land. It's a region. So Abba always guides your journey in him, and he divinely leads you, and often, without your awareness, I would say most of the time. There are times when you, you're kind of clued in. You may have a sense of what Abba's doing. You say, okay, Lord, I, I see what you're doing. You're, you're leading me toward this, and, and you may be clued in to some degree. You never have it all, but most of the time, you really don't see what he's doing. It, it's, he's moving you without your awareness, to certain places for specific reasons. And this is always going on in your life, in your walk with him. When you're intentional about the Lord, about being in the center of his will, doing what he's asking you to do, then you can know that his unseen hand is always guiding you in that journey. And there was a divine intersection. There was a certain place. There was a machom that Abba was leading Jacob to. And he stayed there that night because the sun had set. Now, Jacob's journey was arrested by a practical need. He could no longer see. That's the reason that he stopped where he stopped. There, there's no other reason for him in his mind. He just ran out of light. And we all know in that time, you know, he's got no flashlight. He's got no technology that, that can create artificial light for him. And so he has to stop. And that's the reason. And there's no other reason in his mind. So when you stop living your life by the natural light of what you can see and what you can do, you find yourself in a place where you can perceive by supernatural light. And this is the opportunity to gain new perspective and understanding of what you previously could not, what's really going on around you. So you might find yourself in a place, you might be in a place right now where you've lost the natural light. You've lost the ability to see really your next step. You don't know what's next you, and you can't go any further because there's no ability to do that. And you're, you're trying to see into the darkness, but you just can't. So the best thing for you to do, really the only thing you can do is just to stop right where you are. But it's in those times in your life, actually, that you're being primed to see something you could not before. And those times are when the Lord can show you what's really going on in the real world. Remember, the supernatural world, the world that's always existed, is the real world. And so there's a real world dynamic happening around Jacob. He's completely unaware He's still walking by natural light. He's still walking by what he can do. He's still walking by his own plans. And the light ends and he has to stop. And that might have even frustrated him a little bit because he's a goer and a doer. And I'm sure he's like one of those guys. Maybe your dad was like that. Maybe you're like that. When you get in a car, we're going to go 1,200 miles and we're not going to stop to use the bathroom or anything. We got to get there. And that's Jacob. You know, I'm, I'm going to get to Haran but he can't, he has to stop. Well, he didn't know it. He, run out, he ran out of natural light, but he was about to experience supernatural light. There was a divine intersection. There was a certain place that Abba was leading him to. Well, taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Under his head is Merishah, and it's a feminine noun and it means the place at the head, dominion. 
and to lay down is shahab, and it means to relax, to rest, to sleep. It's also used for intimate physical relations, and it's also used in the Hebrew uh, to mean to die, to die. So shahab is the idea of just total surrender. So he, he, he lays down, he, he takes all of his power out of his body, so to speak. He's in a supine position, he's resting. And it's important, the scriptures tell us that he took a rock and he put it under his head. So complete rest, total surrender on the rock, who is Christ, 1 Corinthians 3, 4, puts you in a proper position to hear, see, and receive from heaven's perspective. So Yahob, Jacob, he doesn't know what's going on really. He ran out of natural light, that's why he stopped. He couldn't go any farther. He's still, it's unbeknownst to him, God is doing an amazing thing. But he lies down, he takes this rock, he rests his head on the rock. The type here is astounding. He rests his head on the rock, who is Christ in the spirit. He is completely dead, so to speak, to himself. He, he's lying down on the ground. He's not using any of his own energy. Uh, he's resting his mind on the rock, and he goes to sleep. That, beside being dead, physically dead, that, that is as surrendered as you can get. That's, that's a state of, state of total surrender. And it's in that state, it's in that place, it's in that position that something profound happens. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And we see in John 151 how Christ appropriated this moment to himself because he said, you will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, he's speaking to a Hebrew audience, and so they know this story. And what, they don't understand the magnitude of it, but they realize that he is appropriating Jacob's ladder to himself. He is saying to them, I am that ladder. Jacob saw me effectively in that moment. But when you're in a place of complete surrender in Christ, which means no natural dependence or perception, it's in that time and place that you gain the spiritual vision and access needed to accomplish God's heavenly will on earth. Now, again, remember where Jacob is. He's operating by his own strength. He's operating by his own ability, his own mind. He's operating by natural light. He's moving forward in his journey. And that's not wrong, bad, or evil in and of itself. Remember, all things are spiritual, and the natural world also is spiritual because God created it. But he runs out of natural light. He realizes he can't go any further in his journey, so he stops. He rests his head on the rock, who is Christ. He's in a state of complete surrender. And that opened him up, actually, to see something he'd never seen before, could not see on his own. He has, his natural mind has been arrested. His conscious mind has been arrested. So the barriers are no longer there. And so now Abba can speak to his spirit and he can see something in the spirit realm he could not see with natural eyes. He could not see with natural thought and ability. And many times in your journey in the Lord, that will happen when, when you find yourself arrested, stopped, uh, in, a, in a, a barrier, a wall, there's something in front of you, you can't see beyond it, you can't get beyond it. Instead of becoming frustrated by that, just lie down in the Lord and rest your head on Christ. Put your mind, put your heart on him. Rest on him. Just empty yourself of your own strength, your own agendas, your own plans, your own abilities. Stop trying to figure it out for yourself. Don't try to make something happen. Don't try to struggle through the darkness. Just rest. Die in that place to yourself. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, Paul would later say. Because it's in that place that you become completely open to what he wants to say to you, what he wants to do, what he wants to accomplish. And so that's what's happening here. He, his conscious mind has been put to sleep. There's no longer a barrier there. It's no longer Jacob's thought processes. It's no longer his agenda. He's in a completely surrendered state. And then Abba speaks to him through this dream. He opens his spiritual eyes into the real world around him. And he sees what's going on in that place. 
Well, it's a specific vision for, excuse me, position for a specific land. In verse 13, and a reason I chose the New Revised Standard for this is because I believe it's more accurate. Uh, the sc scholars debate this particular translation. They don't know whether to say, and the Lord stood beside him, and the ESV says, at the top, but, and it, but it also, uh, in the margin, says it could be translated beside him, and through prayer and through study, and I'm not pretending to be a language scholar, but the Lord has convinced me that it is supposed to be beside him as the Revised Standard uh, renders it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. So Abba personally came to stand beside his son to intimately speak to him. And through personal intimacy with God, you're given spiritual authority over the territories in which you're fully surrendered to his purposes. And that's key. You're given spiritual authority over the territories in which you are personally surrendered to his purposes. That, that surrender is essential because those are the people to whom he's going to entrust that authority, that responsibility, that blessing, that stewardship. He was in a specific position and granted a specific land. Well, it's an exponential blessing your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So the fruit of your surrendered obedience is not limited to one territory alone, but continues to expand throughout the earth by his spirit. And what's done in your own personal life, your own personal ministry, the ministry of Beaten Bow Cornerstone, while God has given this specific territory to you guys, which means this plot of land and this city, it's also exponential, north, south, east, and west, because he is blessing the earth through this ministry, literally. Y'all have physically gone to other nations. You've gone to other continents. Uh, there's a lot that he's doing. It's an exponential blessing, but that's always true for the children of God in your own personal life, your own personal ministry, apart from this ministry and this life, uh, your personal obedience is affecting other lives and it becomes exponential. And that's what he's showing Jacob in this point. But we're to treasure his promises and this is key. Behold, I'm with you and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised you. The word behold there is the word shamer, and it means to keep, to guard, observe, watch, protect, to treasure up in your memory. And this is what Abba is saying to Jacob. He's saying, I've, I've been giving you vision. I'm, I'm making a promise to you. Treasure this in your memory. Perceive it. Make it a part of your DNA. Look at it. Think about it. Talk about it. Hold it in your heart. Because this is a journey. We're on a journey here. This is not a sprint. This isn't all going to unfold today or tomorrow or next week. He's an eternal God. He has a long-term plan. And Jacob was going to find himself in some very difficult places, some long, hot, dusty roads. There would be difficulty in his life, pain in his life. You know, he would be lied to and think that uh, his son had been killed and he would suffer the grief of a death that never happened. I mean, there's a lot of things that he would have to endure. There was a lot that was going to go on in his life. And, and you need to know that. And everybody in this room can probably relate to some special moment with the Lord you've had whether it's certainly at your salvation or there's a time when you, you had clear vision, uh, blessing, uh, encouragement, whatever that was. And that was real and that was the Lord and that's good. But, you know, a, a day happens and a week happens and all of a sudden it's not so much anymore. And a matter of fact, it, now it's actually kind of seeming like it's going away. And, well, that's really not how it was at all. And you know, we've talked about the analogy of the arrow. When 
God gives you an arrow of vision and you see it and you grasp it. Well, he says, that's where I, I want to send you. Well, when that happens, however, for an arrow to be launched, it has to go backwards first. And a lot of tension has to be built around that arrow. And so the, that backwards direction and that tension is actually building the energy and the force that's needed to get that arrow where it has to go. And so as it was for Jacob, he's having this arrow moment. He's been given this vision. But there's a lot in his life that's actually going to seemingly go backwards before he's able to be launched into this. And so Abba's telling him, he's saying, treasure this, Jacob. Treasure it in your memory. Know it. Own it. Think about it. Because when you get in that dry place, when you get to Haran, you're going to need to remember this because there are days when everything about it is going to say the opposite. And it might be two days. It might be three days. It might be a week. It might be a month. It might be longer than that. And so you need to have this treasured in your heart. You need to have this in your mind. You need to own this. This has to become a part of who you are so that that will sustain you in those moments. And you're reminded that even though this is difficult in the natural, there's a real world around me. There's another world around me. Second Kings, where Elisha's servant, when Elisha prayed, let him see what's really going on. We have an army surrounding us, and it was real, but it was a natural army, and it was there, and it was bent on capturing them. And that's a scary thing, and the threat was real. But Elisha said, Lord, let him see what's really going on. And so Abba opened his spiritual eyes, and he was able to see that God had a greater army around them. And so Elisha was protected in his own heart and mind by the knowledge of what's really going on. So even though you can't see it in the natural, well, you have to own it, and it's personal. And somebody can't do this for you. I remember one time, a, uh, he was in his 90s. He was a retired uh, president of a seminary, and I heard him speak at our, our fellowship. And the only thing I remember, I don't know what he preached about, but he made a statement that I've never forgotten he said, in a time of crisis, you can't borrow someone else's faith or their Bible. And what he meant by that was, when the moment comes, and it's the difficult moment, the faith that you have is yours, and that's what you have to live on in that moment. And the amount of Bible that you have in you, the scripture, the word, in that moment, is what you've got. And so you can't borrow somebody else's faith in that moment. And you can't borrow the scriptures that are in them. If it's not in you, it's not in you. So what you have in that moment is what you have. And so Abba's sowing all of this into Jacob so that when he gets into those crisis moments and when he get into those dry places and when things aren't going the way he wants them to go and they're going the opposite direction, he's treasured this in his memory. And that's what he goes to. He goes to that well and he remembers this experience. He remembers the promise of God. He remembers that God never changes and that sustains him in that time. So treasure his promises. But you have to know what they are before you can treasure them, don't you? In verse 16, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Awoke is the word yachatz and it means awaken, become active, and know is yadah, and it means to know by experience, to perceive, and it also is a word in Hebrew for physical intimacy between a husband and a wife. So when Abba gives you something by his spirit, you have to choose to activate it in your soul to fully come to embrace and know it. The awareness must become a part of your conscious thought because you do not sleep or dream your way through life. You actively live it. See, what happens here now, there's a soul activation. There's a transfer. Remember, God has created all of us as a threefold being. We're a spirit, we're a soul, and we're a body. We see that throughout scripture. And so this is a spiritual time when he's dreaming. He is completely arrested in his physical strength, physical activity, and conscious mind. And that's when God is showing him all this. He's removed all the barriers. But something has to happen because while this is happening in the spirit realm, it's got to be transferred into the realm of the soul, in your thoughts, emotions, and your personal will. So Jacob awakes, he becomes active, and he transfers this into his conscious thought life now. It has to be from the dream life into the conscious thought life. It has to be in the natural mind also. 
because you still walk in a natural world. You don't dream your way through life. You don't sleep your way through life. You actively live it. And so he's activating what's happened in the spirit realm into the natural, and he's bringing it into his conscious mind because you've got to be able to consciously think through this in your natural mind each day as well. And so that's what's happening here. He's living it. He's activating it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. Verse 17. This is the first mention of the practice of anointing in scripture, by the way. Now, the word anointing in Hebrew does not appear here, but this is the practice of anointing. He's pouring oil on the rock. This is a profound picture of the person anointing and purpose of Christ in the earth. He is the rock and the gate. He's the cornerstone in the way. He's the Messiah, the anointed one, and he restores full access to God. Profound moment that God facilitated in this situation, but he's anointing the rock. And so what's happening here is that Jacob has a spiritual, supernatural experience, and he transfers it into the natural spiritual by consciously thinking about it. You know, it's like that with our own dream life. All of you can probably relate that uh, when you wake up after a dream, if you start consciously thinking about it and remembering it in that moment, then you start owning it and you can put the pieces together. But if you don't, you lose it. I mean, it'll be by mid-morning. You, you, you know that you had a profound dream, but if you didn't consciously process it or write it down or think it through, it's gone. And so you have to bring what God is giving you into your conscious mind also. You have to be active about that. And then you have to transfer it into whatever action might be required to that. So he has the supernatural experience of seeing what's really going on. He transfers it into his conscious mind, and then he acts on it. So you have those three spheres of, of his being, spirit, soul, and body being activated all at once. And so this cements this, if you will, into his being because he remembers the vision. It's consciously in his mind, and then he acted on it. And he anointed that rock. And so he has all of this from which to draw for the rest of his life. He can see it. He can feel it, taste it, touch it. He owns it. It's a part of him. But God is also showing a type. He's pointing to his son. He's pointing to the anointed one. Messiah, Mashiach, means anointed one in Hebrew. And that's who Christ is. He is the anointed rock. And so it's a profound picture there. But you also see all three aspects of his being brought into this. And watching over that certain place, he, of course, being Jacob, called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of the city was Luz, which means almond tree at the first. And we see in Jeremiah 111, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. And so the place is almond tree. And in, in the scriptures in the Hebrew, almond trees have to do with wakefulness, watchfulness, and also hastening. And Abba uses this later in speaking to Jeremiah, asking him what he sees. He says, I see an almond branch, an almond tree. And he says, that's right. I'm watching over my word to perform it. And by the way, parenthetically, we've talked about this, how when Peter was in the boat with the others, Christ is walking on the water, and they call, they're afraid. You know, they have a problem. They've been rowing all night in the storm. The threat was real. The danger was real. They, they could have been uh, capsized and drowned. That, that was a real threat. But they're fighting against it. And Christ waits till the very end, the last watch of the night, he comes walking on top of the thing that's threatening them. Well, the answer to their problem was scarier than the problem because at first they thought he was a ghost because they'd never seen anything like that and they cry out in fear. Well, what Peter needed to know, he said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you. So what, what's, what's he saying here? First of all, I need to know it's you. 
number one. And then second, if you'll command me to come out on the water, then, then I can do it because he knows that God watches over his word to perform it. So if Christ speaks the word, he'll perform the word if Peter acts on it. So that's a little side note there, no extra charge, but um, that's what's happening here. And so he's saying, I'm watching over this, Jacob. I've got this. This is my word. This is my place. This is my location. I've chosen to do this. This is my plan. I'm watching over it all. I'm going to do this thing. So Abba had watched and protected this place in order to reveal it and give it to Jacob and his spiritual descendants forever. And he's leading you to those certain places as well. And another thing that we see here is you have authority over that which you have the power to name. We've talked about that. That's a biblical principle. You have authority over that which you have the power to name. You name your children. You have authority over your children. If you start a business, you name that business. You have authority over that. And so Abba is giving Jacob authority over that place. The place was called Luz, which means almond tree. I'm sure the Chamber of Commerce was actually glad to be called Bethel because they were called losers. No, 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 uh, no charge. Um, Luz is not bad. Almond tree is not bad. Nothing wrong with that. But it's now Bethel. And Abba had chosen this certain place all by himself before Jacob was even born. He had already had this spot chosen before he created the world. He said, I'm going to create a world. And in that world, I have a place chosen where I'm going to be. I'm going to establish my, my house there. I'm going to establish my family there. And from there, I'm going to bless the nations. That was already in God's plan. So you can know this about your own life. Before you were born, Abba had it all figured out. And he has certain places for you to be. He has things that he has for you. There are some divine intersections. There are some divine relationships, divine encounters. It's already planned out. But here's the key. You have to own it for yourself because there is personal choice involved. And if you choose not to do this, he'll choose somebody else. You know, the, the fact of the matter is that Esau actually could have been the one who had the birthright. He actually had it. It was his. He chose to give it up. So in our lives, we have to own personally what Abba offers us. And so that's what Jacob is doing here. But he's leading you to certain places. So for his part, he's always going to fulfill his promise. He's always going to fulfill his oath. There's no question about that. But he's calling us to own that in our own hearts, to say yes to him. He waits for your yes. And if your answer is yes, then you can trust that it's his plan. He wants his will done more than you do. And I say that to myself all the time, and I say it to others around me. When people get stressed about making a decision or messing something up, so, well, the big question is, do you want what God wants? That, that's really the only issue. Because if you want what he wants, then he's going to make sure that it happens because he wants his will done more than you do. I mean, you, you might consider yourself really loyal and you're really zealous for the Lord. Lord, I'm zealous for you. Well, however zealous you think you are, he's more zealous for his own word and his own plan than you'll ever be. And so you can rest in that and just know. It's just like, let's go back to the first of the story. Oh, Jake's walking along. And he ain't got a clue what's going on. All he has is the birthright and, and, and a personal plan. That's it. And he's heading toward his own personal plan. But he has the birthright, and Abba knows this, and Abba treasures this, because this is, represents everything he is, everything he has, and his purposes. He, it's, it's the blessing of the son. Abba's got that. He's like, all right, here's the one who has my birthright. <laughs> I'm with him. I'm tracking with him. I'm walking with him. And I've got a spot picked out here. And he's clueless, but I'm going to cause this journey to come to a place where the sun's going to set. He's not going to be able to go anymore. And he didn't know that, but I've got a divine certain place for him. And I'm going to speak to him. I'm going to show him something. You have certain places in the Lord. He's got you. He's with you. 
He's got divine intersections and divine relationships and meetings and all those things are mapped out for you. And you can have peace in that today. You can know this today. All you have to do is surrender. Just be surrendered. Let God be God. He will speak to you. He will show you and he will accomplish his good purpose. Abba, we thank you so much for your living word to us today. It is a living word. The words of these scriptures are as alive in this moment as they were when you first revealed them to Jacob himself. No difference. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is a living word. It's a now word, and it's for every person in this room. So, Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for your astounding love. You're the same one who spoke to Jacob, the same God, the same Abba who spoke to Jacob. You're speaking to us right now by your spirit. Yeshua, you are the same Christ who walked on the water, walked on the dusty roads with your disciples, spoke, loved, healed, taught, embraced. You're the same Yeshua, and you're with us. And everybody in this room, Lord, has certain places in you. And that certain place, Lord, we realize that there are natural, physical locations that you mean, as you did in this, but there are also supernatural locations of the heart. There's a certain place that we meet with you every day. And Lord, that place is to be treasured in our hearts. And our prom your promise to us is to be treasured, Lord. And we draw from that. We stand on your promises in those dry places, those difficult places in the journey. When we can't see, we don't understand, we don't like it. When it seems like life has turned against us, people have turned against us, friends have betrayed us, everything's going in the opposite direction from what we would desire or think or hope. But we can know in those moments that you haven't changed, your promises aren't broken, and that you're seeing us through. You did get Joseph out of prison. You did get David out of Adullam. You did guide Jacob every day. And so, Father, we thank you for this. And what you did then, you're doing now. You are the eternal, faithful Father, and we give you all the praise. It's in Yeshua's name and by his spirit we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to y'all.